Well, welcome everyone to a, another exciting edition of the Art Clinic Online. We are um, so excited uh, for this week's presenter, uh, Melissa Ichuji, and I hope I'm saying that uh, correctly, but um, I, I, I actually just met Melissa just through email and, and kind of uh, contacting her uh, to present her us, but she has been a DC icon as long as I can remember, at least started working with Lenny. Uh, you know, some of the big names in DC, she always comes up in there. Um, and I think actually one of the best, I was searching her, her webpage for ways to introduce her, but she actually has an incredible uh, quote by uh, Martin Irvine about what she's about. And I, I think uh, I'm going to actually just read it because it is probably the best sum up of her work and who she is as an artist that I can come up with. So uh, Martin says, Melissa thinks deeply about the conceptual and emotional uh, um, uh, renaissance of her work in the context of the long history of Dada's and surrealist work, the histories of sexual representation in art and popular culture, and the connections with her experiences in dance and performance. Her sculptures are at once intimate, personal, and playful, and prompts for recognizing some of our deepest psychose psychosexual fantasies and repressions. Many of Melissa's childlike doll figures are also emblems of play, prompting us to recall what having a body was like when there weren't any adults around to police appropriate behavior. And uh, I, th I just thought it was a nice kind of sum up of what she is as an artist and what her work looks like. And hopefully she'll share some more about what her work looks like for us today and talk a little bit about the process and some of her inspirations. So Melissa, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you inviting me here. It's, it's a pleasure. So uh, I'm gonna do my best to be as honest with you as possible. I'd like to tell the truth. I think otherwise, why bother? You know, I think we need more truth tellers. And so that's very important to me. Um, I'd like to tell you some stories about how I became an artist. Uh, I'd like to specifically tell you about five things that I think inspired my work the most. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, and I think it's important to say that the seeds, the genesis of my art started, uh, were planted way before I was even born. This is a quote that resonates with me. It's by William Faulkner, who was a Southern writer, and this is something that one of his characters in a book said, which is, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Meaning that everything we've ever experienced, uh, everything we remember, everything we've heard moves with us through life and informs everything we do, everything we believe, how we interact with our environment. Now, not only that, but everything our ancestors have experienced is embedded in our genetic memory, our blood memory. Now, the fact that this is a Southern writer is relevant to my story because William Faulkner as a Southern Gothic writer was very in tune with the Southern mentality, the sensibility of the Southern mind, which is characterized by deep melancholy and an existential alienation and kind of a dark sense of humor, partly because of the Civil War, the effects of the Civil War and the Great Depression and swaths of humanity in the South that were devastated you know, economically, spiritually, morally. So this is part of my story. So this is my mother. Uh, she was the youngest of eight children. And my cultural heritage is rooted in the Southern traditions of the Appalachian Mountains. So this is the first thing that has inspired my work. My mother, uh, her family were sharecroppers. They grew tobacco. My grandmother's name was Dolly Mae Boone. She was a direct descendant of Daniel Boone, the famous, you know, American folk hero, pioneer, the, you know, king of the wild frontier. If you're too young to know who he is, um, they made movies about him, they wrote songs about him, he had a TV show. So this makes me the sixth great granddaughter of Daniel Boone. So my cultural heritage is rooted in the Southern tradition. So uh, my mother grew up in a lot of poverty. She describes living in a house with dirt floors. 
She was surrounded by a lot of violence, a lot of angry, frustrated men, alcoholics, and a lot of their frustration was taken out on the women and the girls. You can imagine. So although her experiences are not the things that I've experienced, in so many ways, her experiences are part of my narr narrative, my biology. I've heard stories and I've absorbed that narrative, right? So the good thing about Appalachia is its rich history in craft and artisanship. So I come from a long line of expert quilt makers, blacksmiths, writers, weavers. My grandmother was an expert quilt maker. So this is the first thing that's inspired my work. Now, my father was a precision machinist. He made parts for NASA and night vision equipment. And he had a shop where I spent a lot of time as a young girl. He taught me how to use tools, how to work with my hands, how to be in an environment with men and you know, be able to handle myself as a young girl. My parents together, were beatniks. They were interested in avant-garde art. They took my sister and I very young to like foreign films and performance things and happenings. And so this is the second thing that's informed my work so much is the things that I was exposed to as a child. Now, some conventional parents might have thought that the things that we were exposed to weren't necessarily appropriate for children. For instance, on our coffee table, routinely, uh, there would have been a joy of sex, there would have been a Kama Sutra, there would have been erotic Japanese art, you know, Salvador Dali, surrealism, things like that. So that's the second thing that's informed my work. Now, the third thing that's informed my work is an event that happened when I was a child. So from the time I was born until I was five, we lived on this like little counterculture farm. It was sort of fashionable at the time to live off the grid. And so my parents found this isolated piece of land where we grew vegetables, where we had animals like goats and geese and rabbits, we skinned rabbits and ate quail's eggs. So I was feral, let's say. I don't recall really going to school. One night, it was winter, I was five, and in the middle of the night, our house caught on fire. Uh, the furnace had leaked oil. And so by the time we were really aware, uh, the house was pretty much engulfed in flames. So we barely escaped. Um, my mother had to break a window, jump out of a window. It was just everything burned to the ground. Um, a couple of days later, we returned to the scene, sifting through the ashes. My mother was trying to find like her wedding ring. So one of my very first memories is of pulling a charred rib bone from the burnt body of my beloved dog, Grendel, who was a, a Weimaraner, right? Like with nose, elegant dog. They call it the gray ghost. I thought nothing of this. This seemed perfectly reasonable to me, you know, trying to, to, to salvage something that I loved. I wrapped it in like a McDonald's napkin and took it home. Um, so after this event, my mother went through a very deep depression, and this is relevant. She took all the quilts that my grandmother made and she nailed them on all the windows. She wanted to keep out all the light. And she just were, she was in bed most of the time. So it was almost as if I had suffered two losses. One would have been like everything I knew. The second was like my mom. And I didn't really know how to handle this. I was kind of wild and untamed. I didn't want to go to school. I had a tremendous amount of anxiety. But one thing I had was this basket of little scraps. And I would take my mother's pantyhose and I would make little portraits of her. And pantyhose to me were like the essence of femininity of mom. They were sensual. They kind of smelled like perfume. They were like skin. And so these are some of the dolls that I made when I was young. I actually still have them. Um, so, right, this was the best I could do at five. But it was this first impulse to use making as a way to process a kind of chaos. I was making figures of like my grandmother. You know, I needed a sense of comfort. And this is what I chose to do. It also gave me a sense of self-esteem, which I had very little of. Okay. Puberty hits. I discover boys. I put all this aside and I decide I want to be a professional dancer. Martha Graham, pioneer of 
modern dance says, the body says what words cannot. So I became a professional dancer. And, and what I learned is that the body doesn't lie, that our internal life is communicated through our physicality. That no matter what you think, you might be hiding from the world, your body will betray you. The way you move, the way you expand, the way you contract, it's subtle and sometimes subliminal, but nonetheless, the way we move and our body it, uh, communicates the state of our psychology. I went to a high school for performing arts uh, in Washington, D.C., Duke Ellington School for the Arts. At 17, I moved to New York City uh, on a scholarship at the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, the Martha Graham School. From there, I had a 15 plus year career as a professional dancer and performer. So another um, formative event happened, which is that on stage in a production of West Side Story in Scotland, I collided with another dancer on stage. I broke a bone in my foot. They sent me home to recuperate. I'd been on tour for like a year, but I was out of the tour. While I was home, I started making um, things again, just instinctually. And in retrospect, now I know that there is this connection between making and mending. My sister said, you know, you never went to college, which is true. I totally bypassed the college experience and went right into a professional career. Why don't you go to school for art? This is something you seem to like. And so I did. I went to the Corcoran College of Art and Design in DC. While I was there, I had some great professors that Helped, helped me understand what art could be other than just the plastic arts, you know, conceptually performative. And so I naturally gravitated toward performance art. This is an example of something I did. Uh, I designed this durational piece called Stripped, where I systematically started eliminating things from my life that I had become dependent on. I was very interested in Buddhism and Zen and yoga and the idea that you know, our amount of suffering is directly proportional to our amount of attachments and grasping. And so I was very interested in exploring this idea of what can I do without and how much do I really need? And so over the course of months and weeks, I systematically kind of stopped doing things, stopped eating sugar, stopped caffeine, alcohol, sex, talking, stopped eating, you know, wearing color. And I moved myself out into a tent in my yard eventually ended up on a platform in front of the Corcoran Gallery of Art. I'd stopped eating by this point. I just had liquids. I was using these jars to pee in. So everything was very public, right? This was like about exposure, about being vulnerable. Um, it ended up like on the front of this, you know, the style section of the Washington Post. So this gave me some indication that this was a viable direction, you know, to go ahead and devote myself to contemporary art. About this time, my senior thesis was going to happen. I didn't know what I was going to do. My sister shows up at my door with these pantyhose, bras, lingerie. She'd worked at a department store and had amassed this collection over the years. Most still had the tags on. She says, you know, maybe you can do something with the art with these. And so I started going through them and it brought back all these memories from childhood of these pantyhose and this sensibility. And so it just ignited this desire to make figurative sculptures that were reminiscent of dolls incorporating these fabrics, which is what I did. So for my thesis exhibition, this was the beginning of what I would call, you know, the, the modality in which I work, primarily figurative sculpture focused on the experience of the feminine. Um, there's a book called The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. And in it, he talks about the tendency of children to hurt things as a way to understand them. For instance, you might see a child pull the wings off of a butterfly, not necessarily meaning to hurt it, just wanting to know what it will do. How, how is it going to respond? And so part of the... Um, Inspiration behind my sculptures are awakenings, like the moment before knowing, from not knowing to knowing. And so in a way, this particular sculpture, which is the first one I made, is about the awakening of like empathy, right? So we have this 
turtle that looks like it's been hurt. We're not sure if she heard it or she came upon it. But nonetheless, there's this recognition that as others hurt, I too hurt. So there's this like vulnerability, right? Um, I'm still exploring like the language of stage, like these are staged fantasies, private moments that are in public, uh, interested in this idea of the body as a container that's ephemeral. And now I'm borrowing language from my Appalachian roots of quilting, right? Like textiles, things that are deeply feminine and domestic. So um, the fifth thing that has informed my work is my relationship to femininity in general. You know, being a woman is really, being a woman is really the only thing I can speak about with authority, right? It's the one thing I can speak about with full authority. And so in this particular sculpture, it's called Schoolgirl. And I'm interested in the way that girls and women learn language. And um, it's kind of like common knowledge that women are often advised to modify their language when they go into the workforce. I mean, I'm not so sure about now, but women have a tendency to use language differently. They use feeling words, not everybody. I feel, I sense that, excuse me, but, oh, I'm sorry. Don't mean to disturb you. There's this like diminishing language. And so in this piece, I was exploring how do girls and women learn language? which possibly the goal of the feminine, of the erotic maybe. Fertile girl, this now I'm starting to incorporate found objects, natural objects that were once alive. These are, are figs that are under her skin. They were frozen on the vine, they never matured. I was going through fertility treatment at this time. And when you do that, when you are of a certain age or when things aren't working out, they talk about eggs and fertility and all of that in very clinical terms. And so I was thinking about that, you know, about fertility as, I don't know, like disease or something. And that girls, when they're born, they're born actually with millions of eggs or a million, but they had at one point millions. And that we kind of take it for granted, you know, until you really need them. Awakenings. So now I'm borrowing materials that were from my grandmother, you know, that this sort of physicality would have been totally repressed. But now in my sculptures, I'm celebrating this, right? Like owning it, taking ownership. Um, so they're embedded with kind of a previous history, but I'm reinventing the narrative. So this awakening, this sexual awakening in public, a voyeuristic kind of presentation too. Uh, you know, as a dancer, you're not paid to have an opinion. You're paid to be the material. You are the material for the choreographer, for the director. And so I was obviously, you know, referencing my experience as a dancer. But in this case, the feeling of wanting to be seen, you know, as more than just the surface. Um, and here she's sort of revealing the most, you know, vulnerable part of herself that makes her in a way who she is. Um, there's also this reference to like, you know, the sensuality of like revealing the most vulnerable part of yourself. We know this like from vampires, this very sensual act of like revealing like the point of eroticism and also the, the point of where you could kill, right? There's something really interesting about that to me. <laughs> All right, this piece is called Glissade, and it obviously borrows from my experiences as a dancer, but also this commentary on, you know, the lengths to which women and girls will go to, to conform to a certain beauty standard. So here I have incorporated an antique mandolin, which is used to grate vegetables. I've created a slide, and so they're gleefully sliding down this blade to remove unnecessary excess. I'm just going to kind of buzz through these a little bit just to, you know, give you a sense. Um, you know, I don't know, like suppressed rage. But the fact of the matter is, is that dancers often use meat in their point shoes uh, because cotton compresses and meat doesn't. It's like a second skin. It is skin. <laughs> um, so, again, still incorporating these 
fabrics, you know, femininity, scarf, this belonged to my mother. Uh, borrowing language from the world of dance, this constant scrutiny, measuring up. Um, there's also this term in psychology called the second arrow, which is that, <clears throat> you know, you'll do something wrong or something wrong will happen. And that's the first arrow. The second arrow is that you take responsibility for it. You feel shame for it, or you feel like it was your fault. This is called selfie. And it's about this propping up, this desperate need to work against gravity. It's also kind of like a torture device, you know, self-inflicted kind of need to stay up, stay relevant. Uh, the classic dance with mortality, right? So here we've got this feminine domestic fabric. We have this figure that is writhing with something unsettled. We're not sure if it's psychological. We're not sure if it's literal, but nonetheless, it's this exploration again of the body as temporary, as very ephemeral, the stage, the private moment. Again, like the interest in mortality. Uh, I'm here incorporating hair from people that I love that are no longer alive. This now lives in somebody's living room. And that's part of it, right? Like letting go. Here I'm using bone, you know, referencing things that were once alive. I think it's this desire to want to reanimate things that inevitably are doomed. Uh, I went through a period of like couples, interested in like the yin and yang of things things that apply, imply one another. So here you've got the figure with the buttons, you've got the other one with the buttonholes, so they are meant for each other. They go together, they imply each other. This piece is called prick. You have the one figure with the pins, you've got the other one that's the pin cushion, right? So they're made for each other. She was asking for it, right? Um, this is called us in eternity. It's kind of about this desire to merge, but at the same time having to let go of our idea of ourselves and our identity in order to see the connection and accept uh, another. I'm using objects from my life, literally letting them go. The exploration of fertility, the cycle of life, creation and destruction. So here she's got this nest of eggs and her tail is coming in to eat them. So it's like a self-destructive cycle. All right. So this piece is called digestion. And, you know, lately I've been posting some things publicly and they've gotten a little bit of pushback. And um, I think there's a inability to see metaphor lately, um, you know, and subtle nuance. Nonetheless, I get it. So this is a prepubescent figure, potentially maybe, who has in her gut something that resembles intestines. You know, the, the gut is considered the second brain. And so this could also look like brains, but it's not, right? Like it's penises. So I don't want to like tell you what to think of this piece, but you know, when we think of the penis, what's the cliche, right? Like it's the symbol of power. How many monuments look like penises? How many perfume bottles look like penises? It's a cliche, right? Like a phallic symbol. So you could say that she's being colonized by masculinity, either psychologically or literally. You could say that she has taken captive of the masculine, nonetheless, it, you know, it's open to interpretation. You know, so again, the fifth thing that has informed my work is the experience of the feminine. Part of that is motherhood. This piece is called Shape Sorter. It's kind of my version of Madonna and child. So here you've got this child that's discovering woman by pulling her apart and kind of devouring her. So he's exploring the pieces that kind of equal woman, that equal love, the eyes, the mouth, the breasts, etc. She's also kind of held captive. 
I've incorporated pieces that my father made. I've incorporated clothes that I've owned. This piece is called Mother Sucker, interested in just a simple feeling of heaviness and tiredness. This piece is called Reverie, the absent mother lost in thought. This is a real chair, so this is a life-size sculpture. This piece is called Domestic Goddess. So she's kind of at once warrior, clown, prophet, somewhat animalish, you know, animalistic as well. I've incorporated some kitchen utensils, like a grater and things that also kind of look like weapons. This is life-size. This piece is called Homebody. Uh, the shapes are kind of phallic, but they're also feminine. The house is a classic symbol for this, the psyche. So this, these pieces are like outgrowing their home, their container. I'm really interested in incorporating found objects. And one of the things I love are like nests, things that have been abandoned, things that were once alive. This is a wasp's nest and I've incorporated it into this figure. Again, this imagery of something writhing under the surface, unrest, the language of bondage, the language of femininity, all sort of coming together. All right, so at some point I revisited performance art and I was interested in how can I combine this sculpt sculptural technique that I've been using and incorporate it <clears throat> into the physicality of performance art. Still interested in the idea of non attachment. So I made this suit, layers of skin, that I sort of perform this grotesque burlesque where I'm removing layers of symbolic layers of artifice and ego. I want to get to the bone to see what's underneath when you remove all that stuff. At the end, what's left is this mirrored suit that to me represents the void, emptiness. This is the same outfit, suit, sculpture on a figure that I made. And this is at Art Brussels. So now the work is, is being displayed internationally. Um, so the performative pieces become sculptures that are then part of somebody's collection basically. I went through a period of like wanting to do things like very realistic or not realistic, but representational. This was a time when there was a, an important election cycle. And so I started to make some busts. I was interested in the psychology of people. And so this is a portrait of Newt Gingrich. This isn't really relevant right now in our time, but nonetheless, he was accused of having um, affairs with the interns. And so I made a bust of him out of panties and bras. This is uh, Mitt Romney. This is what they would have looked like in an, uh, uh, an exhibition. So they were like trophy heads. The, the title of it was called Fair Game. And so you can see the scale. This is part of an exhibition called In the Flesh. It was at uh, Schmucker Gallery. And now my work is starting to be shown. This is after college starting to be shown in international art fairs. If you've never been to one, it's a marketplace for art. Now, I wanna say something, which is that, um, you know, there comes a time in an artist's life, if they're lucky, that somebody takes an interest in their art, they get it. And in my case, there was one collector specifically. So I was part of a gallery in Washington, DC, Irvine Contemporary. They took my work to um, an international art fair, Art Basel. And there, a collector from Brussels saw my work, understood the importance of it, collected it um, prolifically. His name is Alain Servet. He's a very important art collector now. So it was critical, right, to my art getting exposure overseas because the nature of my work isn't for everyone, right? It takes a certain tolerance <laughs> and sensitivity. Not everybody wants this in their living room. So suddenly now my art is being compared to more classical, um, you know, expressions also shown alongside other contemporary artists that were interested in body politics and, um, you know, femininity, Cindy Sherman, 
here. This is a gallery in Paris, uh, Gallery Sophie Scheidecker, also another person that's been a great champion of my work. So this gives you a sense of what these pieces look like in space to scale. This is American University Museum at the Katzen Art Center. Give you a sense of scale. So some other materials that I've used, ceramics. I was really interested in this idea of fragility, something touchable, but also very fragile, but still dealing with the same themes of letting go of um, the body, that the body is just a container for what is the essence of who we are really, starting to merge botanical forms. Okay, then in contrast, going back to my roots with people that have worked with metal, my father. In contrast, I was interested in moving away from these soft forms. I wanted to see how I could use something unyielding, like metal, to create something feminine. You know, I really love this idea of like, <laughs> you know, seducing um, a very un, you know, something that doesn't want to move, like metal, into a feminine form. And not only that, but seeing the record of its making is appealing to me, you know, not trying to hide how it was made. So I was starting to become interested in how can I face fears? And one of them is fire. And so I created this sculpture called Goddess of the Burning House. This is pretty big. It's like 12 plus feet tall. Um, it was also about scale, about sort of commanding um, space and also confronting something that I was afraid of and using it as a tool to empower myself. And so using fire, using metal, which is hard to handle, and creating something that is kind of the embodiment of creation and destruction simultaneously. So this is kind of a Kali-esque figure, you know, kind of a devouring mother. Um, I'm still working with feminine forms, specifically flowers, because there's such a cliche, right? Like people write off flowers as being somewhat trite and cliche, but I love making them out of steel because then they're eternal, right? So now I'm thinking broader in broader terms in terms of like the environment and femininity in general, as in the qualities that keep life alive. And one of those critical things that we really need to start thinking about is our environment and how the hell we're going to figure out this climate crisis. And so the way that I'm sort of digesting it is by creating botanical forms out of steel. And by that, I'm freezing um, something that's so vulnerable now. They're maximal, they're kind of voluptuous. They're at the peak of their prime and I'm attempting to freeze them. So this figure is called Steel Magnolia. And I'm now incorporating like the figurative form with the botanical forms. This is a big sculpture. Again, you've got this form that's like been through something. You know, it wants its humanity to be seen. Steel Magnolia is a term used for a Southern woman who's got like grit, but she's also got sensuality, but she can like use, you know, her wits to get by. Um, so you can see here, there's this reference to a house, this figure that's been through something. And yet in spite of that, there's this resilience, there's this blooming, this blossoming, this reinvention. So you can see the scale. Scale is important. More flowers. Decorative, yes. But still, speaking about um, a resilience in the face of like being bereft of, you know, stability kind of being unmoored and nonetheless being able to thrive. So I'm kind of really into this right now. And it, it feels personal. It also feels more universal. All right. Now, uh, one of the things I'm also doing, because I can't sit still, is exploring performance art again. And so, so I've been posting some things on the internet. I've been working with, you know, again, pantyhose. This is, I'm gonna just go ahead and play this. It's a compilation, it's a mishmash. It's only like two minutes long. So this is sort of my idea of like a tutorial, sort of our obsession with modification, hiding behind modifications.
Okay. One of the things I'm very proud of, in 2016, I started teaching a class that I coined Guys and Dolls. I've trademarked the name, I've trademarked the system of teaching people how to use figurative sculpture as a wellness modality. It's, a, it's an awakening art is what it is. I started teaching in my studio here, and then I started teaching in uh, museums and different venues where I could gather people, mostly women, together. They could use this art of making figurative sculpture to speak about their experiences. And by sharing, it's like a, a, a cathartic experience, right? There's a great power in doing this. And so this has been a very uh, important part of my practice, actually. All right, so now this is kind of where I'm at now. Um, what, what the pandemic taught many artists is that we can't wait around for the gatekeepers. You know, we've got to start creating our own opportunities to share our work in whatever way we can. It just so happens that I live in a small town. It's a charming town, small American town um, in Virginia, outside of Washington, DC. It's called Front Royal. We are in the Shenandoah Valley. And a lot of people come here to see the leaves change. It's like a popular destination. Nonetheless, I have a building where my studio is and I happen to have a storefront. And so I decided during the pandemic, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and create an extension of my studio where anybody that's interested, curators, the community, collectors, gallerists, whatever, can come and experience my work. This is the side of my building. My building is on Cloud Street. A local great artist here, Chris Stevens, and I collaborated on this mural, and we actually have started a little initiative in our town. So we're hoping that other artists will come and do the same. So this is the storefront. We're opening officially June 10th on a Saturday, 2023. Uh, and so we will have regular hours and by appointment only. So that's where I am now. And um, so just in summation, there were five things that I shared with you that have influenced my work. One is my cultural heritage. Two are the things that my parents exposed me to early, art, things like that. Three was an event that happened to me which was somewhat traumatic, but I've learned to transform into um, art. Number four was my experience as a dancer and this idea that um, our biology is also informed by the way we move and it also reveals what's happening in our our mind and emotions. And then number five is just my experience of being a woman in the world and having an investment in, in nurturing that, you know, and the, the strengths of feminine, feminine and feminine um, like qualities, right? A flexibility of a holistic way of looking at things and a receptivity and a sensitivity, right? And just life giving. So for anybody out there who's an artist, I would say the cliche, which is do what you know, talk about what you know, and let the chips fall where they may. So thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's such a treat to, to experience this, uh, uh, this talk. And uh, I'm sure there's plenty of questions uh, that people can either unmute or, or, or put into the chat and we can kind of uh, talk about them. Uh, for you guys. Um, I, I'm fascinated by just kind of the, um, I don't want to say like, like the ability to just put stuff out there that you, do you, do you want to see the imagery or do you feel it's necessary? Is it like the kind of, how do you balance like the desire to make what you want to see in a museum or, or is that what you're, you, you do? You, I don't know how, to, how do I explain this? <laughs> like, like artists should make what they want to see, right? Do oh, you, do they? I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I, I do think. that. Like I never think about like, oh, what would I want to see on my wall? Let me make that. I'm just more interested in telling the truth of, of experience. And by doing so, it's a cathartic experience. And if somebody else can resonate with it, great. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's just, 
uh, I guess that uh, it, that's fantastic. Uh, um, I just never really thought of that in that in that way. Um, cool. Um, Would you I'm sorry. Could you tell us a little bit about when you open your um, storefront um, a little bit more? Sure. Um, so I have a space here we've been renovating for a while. And um, so the goal is to just have a space where the work can be accessible. Also, the mission is to be able to share the work of other artists in a various, you know, various disciplines, maybe music, maybe book readings, things like that. So we'll be open Fridays from 11 to 6, Saturdays from 11, 11 to 6, and then by appointment only for now. And and is it open already? I just didn't know if it, yeah. you had you oh. said you, it will be opening soon, I thought I heard you say, and I yeah. didn't. Yeah, it'll be open. <laughs> we'll, we'll be opening to the general public June 10th, which is on a Saturday. Barbara, go ahead. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I found all phases of your work incredibly powerful and moving. Um, and I've got to say that I frequently was smiling or laughing. And I don't know whether it was from delight or from discomfort in the earlier phases. Or um, I wondered in the element of humor, how much does humor enter into your works? Um, or not. I mean, they're incredibly, you know, powerful. So that's my question. You know, um, I don't know that I'm ever consciously trying to be funny. You know, I don't, I don't think I, I'm, I don't even think I'm very funny. So <laughs> if that's happening, I think it's purely by accident. Um, and maybe what's funny is just that anybody would, I don't know, have no edit. I don't know. I, I really, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Well, I didn't know how to ask it, but I, I okay. got to say that I smiled or even laughed out loud at some of your work. Oh, that's good. I don't know. You know, I don't I know like if you that. see that with people, you know, when you're watching people look at your work in person, whether they ever get their reaction or whether I'm weird. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I think you're so courageous, Melissa. And, and I think like Barbara said, the humor might be on our part in that we try to make sense of how this vulnerability that you're showing us that we relate to absolutely, especially as being women uh, and how we deal with it. Um, so it, it, it is amazing. I think how courageous you are. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but I would add that, in part, some of these aren't necessarily self-portraits, right? And trying to, I think, in a way, tell a collective story, which goes back to this idea that, you know, so much of what we experience and feel is embedded in us from things we're not even aware of. Yeah. And Anthony, you have a question? Anthony? <laughs> Hi there. Yeah. Melissa, thank you so much. That was fantastic. You know, I know your work fairly well, and I am always still amazed at what I can learn listening to you talk about it, especially seeing it in sequence uh, and some new works that I hadn't quite had the chance to catch up on yet. So that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm also always really impressed with how you, and I think a lot of people attempt this and maybe don't always succeed, that tension or that relationship between the bodily and the figurative right and how those coexist in your work always with such an amazing elegance i'm getting to a question um <laughs> i also see especially maybe triggered by the, your use of, of found object i see ritual i see memory instruction history mythology some taxonomy things that are are we may associate more with sort of text-based research and experiences and i wonder just how does writing uh, incorporate in your work or, or is as part of your studio practice do you is that part of your design process or do you see potentially like each of these could have a short story around them do you do you have you done that sort of writing about this work thank you um thank you that's a really good question and I and I have been attempting to write short stories uh that could potentially tell the story of what's happening in these sculptures. So yeah, 
as part of my, my normal practice, I keep reams of papers and journals and writing is very important. And I think that a lot of school teachers um, are lamenting the fact that like cursive writing is becoming extinct because we know, right, Anthony, we know all of you that there's a connection between the physical act and creativity. Yeah. So, yeah. So writing is important to me, or at least moving the pen. I have a question as well. Hi. Which is, um, you know, your work is very visceral. Often it's even gruesome. How do you maintain a sense of, of joy or empowerment or even, even a sense of hope when you're working with such topics and your practice is so encompassed in something so dark? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, I guess I don't see it like that. And I think partly because it might be because of my experience as a dancer where the body is just a material. It's, you know, having said that, like, I don't like cutting up chickens and I don't like blood. So it's really weird that way. Like, I'm not somebody that is very, um, I'm not very, uh, weird in my normal life like I'm not kinky. I don't I don't like gross things I hate horror films so it's really just a vehicle to get to the truth is is what it always is and I love making what I love making that stuff it's absolutely fun I I just adore it I can't explain why I'm attracted to things that are grotesque or yeah I can't really explain it I, I think I like the contrast, you know, between, I, I like the contrast. And again, one implies the other. You can't appreciate something delicate and feminine and, and just, you know, um, unless it's contrasted with the opposite. That, I think that's part of it, is I need the opposites in the most visceral way I can manage. And the fact that they're made of like pantyhose is kind of funny. Uh, that makes sense. Thank you. I want to. Lisa, do you have a question? Yeah, I don't have a question. Are you talking to me? Yeah. The... I have a question <laughs> about going back to this idea of funny. That it's so. It's more what you said a minute ago, Melissa. It's more fun. Your stuff is fun because it's so creative and it's joyful to see creativity, whether it's gross creativity or whatever it is. Is it's just fun. Well, that's so interesting. Like, so, um, so you're not, you're not, you're amused by it. Like it doesn't disturb you, right? Like you can accept it. Yeah. 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 Right. It's just, it's just terrific. It's beautiful. Cause it's truth. Thank you. Thank you. It's not for everyone though. Let me tell you, I get a lot of shit online. Sorry. Excuse me. As as a physician, Melissa, I think that you're doing so much more healing than many physicians out there, especially with your classes. Wow. That healing part of of creating the dolls, for example. I I I would love to participate in one. Um, and and I think that brings people to such a realization and such such an introspection that allows them to express themselves in something, as you said, Grace and Barbara, some, somewhat fun. And yet it's incredibly healing, I think. Thank you. You know, it's an ancient um, art, really. I mean, it's been happening since the beginning of time. I mean, you could say the Venus of Willendorf is a doll. You could. Um, the other thing about dolls is that they're accessible. They're not threatening. And they're also a canvas on which we can project ourselves. I mean, dolls are considered a transitional object in psychology, right? So it's something we are already familiar with. Everybody's had a doll probably at one point. Yeah. Yeah, playful is another word. It's playful because we play with dolls. And, yeah. and the act of making is play. Like I like to consider it as play. Yeah. I have yeah. a question. Yeah, hi. 
Hi, um, I, I'm, I'm an artist as well, but um, I'm sure probably a lot of people here are. Um, I've always felt that my uh, art is more decorative um, and less expressive. And I just had a question. It was really fascinating to listen to all the story um, ab about everything. And I was just curious if you always feel like there is a story or do you ever feel like you're just making things because I don't know you just think it's pretty <laughs> or like it's I don't know does it always does it always have a message you know I never set out like to, to to put forward a message it's usually something that I'm dealing with in my own life like some sort of tension or some desire you know part of the reason I make art is to integrate the things that I'm ashamed of, rage, lust, fear, anxiety, um, it's a way to integrate them, you know? And also part of why I make art is to talk about the things that women are often shamed for, the erotic feminine, you know, being submissive, being assertive, being courageous, being bodacious. So I think it's it's both of those things, but I never really set out like, oh, I'm going to make the sculptures to make a statement about blah, blah, blah. I'll just begin. And then the materials inform. Um, and so in many ways, it is a mystery when artists make things. We're not always sure why we're doing it, but we have to stay open. And that's the fun part is to just trust the process and your intuition, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. And don't be afraid what anybody thinks. Yeah, I just, I don't know, like I've always struggled to find a, to find um, a message in my work and it just never feels like it's there. I don't think, Listen. maybe I'm too young, maybe I don't know enough, maybe I just haven't gotten there. <laughs> no, you're living in the times now. So no matter what you make is a reflection and it's relevant because you're living right now. So no matter what you make is a reflection of the times and it's moving through you. Thank you. Sure. Hi, um, Trisha. Okay, I just want to say so many things, but you are so able to let your subconscious of the experiences you've had in your life be expressed in your work and it, I'm especially taken with how express because of your dance experience understanding of the musculature uh, of the human body that you can express ideas so intensely with the posture of the figures that you create it's absolutely it's beautiful and I think it's a part of a lot of your work is being able to express things not only with your own body, but to create this other facsimile of a body that's that's so impressive with emotion. Thank you. Um, I would say that one of the starting points when I go about making a sculpture is from the inside out. So one of the things I learned from Martha Graham, you know, when we were studying or when we were learning something, it wasn't just a movement. We had to imagine, imagine, you know, she was very much into mythology and like big themes of tragedy. So you imagine like you are, you know, this historic figure or this Greek God, or, you know, you were always meant to internalize the in, inner life of the subtext of this character or the story. And that's also an acting thing where you are embodying this actual spine of, of the character that you're trying to communicate. So I was particularly struck by your um, video. Um, and again, my, my filter is a physician. So I'm thinking about all the uh, plastic surgery that mm. goes on in order to sort of fix ourselves and um, then you express so nicely the sort of the side effects if you will all the tumors and the 
that result uh, as a result because many times it goes wrong and women are <laughs> I was just it's such a wonderful metaphor I mean for many things but for that particular theme I think it just terrifying doesn't get examined watching. enough what did you say Jordan I was terrifying watching you I was so afraid you're going to stab yourself yes. or freak yourself I was like I thought it was amazing. I, I want to do one <laughs> myself. <laughs> I also laughed during that, as terrifying as it was. <clears throat> and again, is that relief of tension or just delight? And I, I'm sorry to repeat that. But... Oh, that's OK. All right, well, thank you. It was kind of clown-like. clown, clown -like. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> is it posted anywhere, uh, Melissa? Or It is. You can find me on Instagram. Oh, OK. I think it in my heart, I'm a clown. I think that's, yeah, I think that's what I, you know, clowns have a huge depth to them. Well, yeah. well, clowns have a sort of, and dolls have an also fearsome and discomforting reputation, depending on the context. So that's interesting also. <laughs> well, the idea that clowns are really have a lot of sadness and that they're... And sadness besides... Um, they are making others joyful, but they may not be having, may not be funny to them. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. This was absolutely incredible. So we're excited that you'll be uh, um, actually hosting a few of our events coming. Yes, I'm so excited. Can we talk about, so Anthony Cervino, um, who for me is up in the upper left corner, uh, will be a guest and I will have the pleasure of having a conversation with him. And then two thoughts. weeks, just so we can kind of, uh, uh, Keep our, 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 our ducks in order. Uh, next, uh, in two weeks, we have uh, Otta Rose hosting an event from, if you can recall, Otta Rose uh, has uh, the gallery in Kensington and she is hosting uh, Maremi Andreozzi. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. Uh, and her work is just absolutely stunning as well. Uh, so we hope that everyone here will uh, come back in two weeks and uh, and be a part of that, uh, that artist discussion as well. And then Anthony is following that in two weeks, correct? Yes. And then I think we have David Page up after that. So we have some really great, great artist discussions coming up in the future. Uh, so you definitely have not seen the last of Melissa. Yes. And actually Anthony too. <laughs> and we can't wait. <laughs> Thank you so much for hosting this, you know, for just making this possible. I think it's Absolutely. doing a great service. That's fabulous. Thanks. Melissa, would you at all be um, interested if we could arrange for you to teach a doll making um, workshop yeah. at Glen Echo would, Park? I would love to. Um, I have a kind of a full plate. Uh, I, I understand. Until, it would until December, be. actually. So Way in the future. <laughs> yes, but definitely. That would be a great Fantastic. Idea. That's great. Thank you very much. This was You're so very great. welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I feel like I know you inside out. Ooh, right. <laughs> And outside in. <laughs> thank a you. Big, a big silent applause. <laughs> oh, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank Enjoy you. your weekend. Bye.